Okay, everybody, this is Brent Chance, and this is Way of Truth Radio. Today we're starting our series on psychotropic drugs in the body of Christ. Not really sure how many uh, parts this will be. Um, you know, there's some people that I want to talk to and, and bring in. and But today I'm joined in the studio with uh, with some guests and some Christian brothers and sisters, and, and we're going to talk about their experiences, uh, you know, being on medication and, and um, kind of the pros and cons of that. But basically... What prompted me to do this series was, um, I remember a few years ago, the Lord spoke so clearly to me on the topic because um, we had some friends over. She was a single mom. She uh, she had a son, and he was probably about seven at the time. And he, um, there was just something about when we were playing, and, and she was a single mom, and so we had him over for dinner, and he, he was playing on the floor, and I was playing with him. And I remember looking in his eyes, and there was just such a blankness in his eyes, um, almost like a daze. And um, I remember talking to my wife afterwards, and um, I said, something just, you know, just just something there. And I don't know what it is, but I, I just felt a check in my spirit. And she went on to tell me that um, he was on several psychotropic medications for ADHD and ADD and um, I didn't even know anything about you know psychotropic medications at the time. However, um, you know I did have family members I knew that were on them. I just didn't know anything about them. But I can tell you this: that night I was I would take times in the evening that night when everybody else had gone to bed. I, that was kind of my routine at the time. Is I was that would be my prayer time. And I remember sitting in my chair down in my living room with the lights off, and I was praying to the Lord. And that that small boy's face just kept coming into my mind. And I just felt the Lord talking to me so strongly that I began to to literally weep. I mean, I I was literally crying as I was praying and praying so passionately that I knew that the Lord was speaking on the topic. And so that kind of is what started my journey um, down that path of, well, what are psychotropic drugs? What is this all about, Lord? And and that type of thing. And and you know, some of the research I've done and some of the, some of the things I've watched and read have just been so um, eye opening and um, in a lot of ways frightening. Now, you know, the thing about doing a, a show like this is that I know that there's lots of people that take these medications, and they will say they help me. And I understand that. Like I said, I have family members that take them, so I, I understand that they feel that they have an effect and that they're helping. Um, but where I want to come from, it, uh, the attitude of it is is from a biblical standpoint, and you know that we are the body of Christ, and that we need to be there for each other and try to help each other and share each other. So, um, you know, I, I want to do a show that's compassionate. I don't want to do a, um, a series that's a, it's kind of like a hit piece and it's all, um, negative. Um, but I also want to, um, just express the deep concern that I have about these drugs and, and what's going on with them. So like I said before, today uh, I'm joined in the studio uh, with some dear brothers and sisters in Christ, sister in Christ, uh, John and Angie Jacobs, um, John and Angie have been involved in street evangelism for many years, um, going out and um, um, sharing uh, the gospel via um, using things like tracks and things like that. And so, um, John, you're 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 here. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about how did you get into doing street evangelism and and that type of thing. Um, I got say back in. No, 1989, 1990, uh, uh, you know, I prayed a sinner's prayer in 89, 90. Uh, is when I really kind of pinpoint my salvation. Um, I have always been active in evangelism, always trying to share the gospel with people. But as far as street evangelism, that really took off about 2006, mm-hmm. 2007, about early 2007. Yeah. Um, and so what got you into street evangelism? I mean, like that's that's kind of a... I would say that it was a series of life events. I mean, uh, some of that uh, preceding that was was my divorce. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that, uh, just a lot of trials that came with that, and it really shook me up. And God used that to shake me up. Yeah. And really try to start moving me out of my comfort zone, and just to be more active in ministry and sure. in, in reaching other people with the gospel and birthing more of a desire in me to reach people with the gospel. That's when I started going on missions trips to China. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and we've had to, you know, to uh, just to clarify, we've had you come in and talk to our men's group uh, in the past about uh, your street evangelism and share uh, some of your experiences and some of the stories that you've had. And, you know, one of the things, and, and I know you personally, you're a good friend, and, you know, one of the things I know that um, you guys would face out there when you're out there going into a lot of times going into some very dark areas, you know, spiritually dark, not necessarily like literally dark, mm-hmm. although it could be dark if you're out at night. Um, but, you know, you're out there. And um, you are you are really going into the enemy's area, and you're you're taking light into darkness, and with with the gospel, and so that's you know that opens up a whole realm of of spiritual warfare that most people probably wouldn't experience unless you were out there on those front lines. You know, I think about people that are involved in homeless ministry, prison ministry, like I'm involved in. You see, when you're out there on the front lines, you see, you see it. It's a battle. I mean, it is a full on spiritual warfare battle. I mean, all those scriptures about the full armor of God and who our real enemies are. And, um, it, that is, um, that all starts to come very true. So agreed. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, I, that was more of an eye opener to me. And frankly, I came in to, when I came into street evangelism and started doing it over from, like I said, from about 2006, 2007. I never really realized the depth and the uh, the depth of spiritual warfare. I never really realized how brutal yeah. the enemy can be. Yeah. I never realized how vicious the fight can actually be yeah I, I never would have imagined it if somebody would have even said said to me i don't think i could have i could have i could have received that yeah well and then having said that i mean it's just like you don't want to scare people off like oh my gosh no I don't, I don't no, ever no, 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 no <laughs> not at all i mean i want to I, I i don't want to sit there and leave it at that i mean i want to say that god is you know that we're more than conquerors in christ i mean and, yeah. and that we have to rely on christ i mean and that's it's all i'm saying is is that the the battle are real. Can be, they're real, yeah. and, they're, and they can be very vicious. Yes, I mean, and and they they're different probably for each each person, but ultimately, I mean, we have to lean on Christ. Yes, and in that, that I think as the battle even gets more severe, I think that we can see a supernatural element where where we see just how great God is. Yes, we can see yes. how powerful. We I don't think we see how powerful He is until we see yes. things sometimes get really really bad. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I was just talking to somebody the other day, and um, it was along the lines of, of psychotropic medications, and we were going back and forth. And you know, I was just sharing with her about there is there seems to be this huge push for um, everybody wants to experience God and or experience Christ or experience the Lord, whatever. And 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 but and so they'll try all these different techniques, these these different I call them New Age mystical type things to try to experience God or be in His presence and everything. And you know, for me. I told her it really comes down to two areas that I, I've in my life, and I can't speak for everybody, but I think this might be a, a pretty good truth for everybody, and that is that you experience the Lord most in two ways. You experience Him the most in your suffering, and you'll experience the most in your service. So if you're out there, street evangelizing, prison ministry, on those front lines, you're going you're gonna to have a real good experience with the Lord because you're going to see Him do things with people that most mm-hmm. people never get to see. You're going to see that miraculous conversion, you know, where the Holy Spirit comes on them and they are born again. Or, you you, you know, you, in your guys' case, you're out there sharing the truth and, and you see that. You just see that that spark get ignited by God, you know. And, and people, you would think there's no way that they're ever going to get this, to, you know, really receive the Lord. And, and so you can experience them in your service. And then the, the flip side of that is that you, you also will you, you devil, really start to experience the Lord in your suffering. And that is when life's trials really come down on you, because you really have two choices: you either you either will turn towards secular solutions, or you will press into the Lord like you've never pressed into Him before. I mean, agreed or I don't know your thoughts on it. I, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you're going to go further on with this later on, but that was probably where I really fell, where I really stumbled. And that's when I started getting on the psychotropic drugs because I was in the midst of a battle beyond anything that I had ever experienced before. And so I kept on crying out to the Lord and I kept on feeling like I was stumbling. I kept on feeling like there was just this this state of panic and anxiety that I had never ever dealt with before in my Christian walk. I mean, typically I would just pray through anxiety and I would ask the Lord to to lift that from me, but this one wasn't lifting. Um. 
since you bridged that uh, that topic there, let's let's talk about your experience. You know, because here you go, you, you've gone from where you're out there and you're doing the street evangelism and you're giving people quote unquote the good news mm-hmm. about Jesus, right? And and so and 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 I just want to say this: I've had my struggles, you know, and and I I've never taken psychotropic medications or, or gone to a psychiatrist or anything like that, but I have learned that I need help from people. You know, and it's just I think the Lord has kind of shielded me and and I you know, I could have easily gone down that path because that's what the world says, well if you're you know, if you're troubled, depressed, you should go see a psychiatrist or go get some medication. Um that was never I was lucky to have, you know, good you know, like Alan and and other friends that were there that if I really needed to talk to somebody about something I could do that and um kind of work through it. Um but I think what you just said is a really critical thing because most people um, don't realize that level of spiritual warfare. They don't realize that you know they're going to come underneath some some attack. And 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 if it's really an equipping thing, right? Because we should be equipping people that are going out there, saying, "No, this is what you're going to face, and don't be surprised when this starts to happen." I know uh, there has been some ministries out there that I've been involved with. And they said, "No, just expect it. Just expect the spiritual attacks." And um, and so that's yeah we should we should be equipping people that go out there and and that are going to be you know doing ministry that you know you're going to come under attack because you <laughs> you're taking the kingdom of God into the world and so um you know the prince of this world's not going to stand for it and he's going to come against you in, in different ways and everybody's a little bit different the way he attacks you and that's that's the other thing I've noticed too that what gets to me may not be the same thing that gets to John and may think the same thing gets to Angie but you know he knows how to get to us you know mm-hmm. and uh, so he's going to try everything and just keep just relent he's relentless and that's why that full armor of god is so critical you know such a critical teaching but um so what was going on in your life john when you you know when you you know what kind of things were you dealing with you know when you decided that you maybe need to go talk to somebody did somebody recommend that you go talk to somebody or is that just something you came up with no really it was um uh, about 2010 2011 um i just started experiencing doubts I started getting doubts about my identity in Christ, and that was what that from there it just it kept building, and I was fully aware of that. I was I was I was it was getting worse, and I was asking Lord, I was like, Lord, this is not right. You know, I don't I don't like dealing with these doubts, and I kept on trying to put the, push them down, and I kept on trying to remind myself of my identity in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, However, there was like about three different attacks, and I call them attacks, not physical attacks, but spiritual attacks yeah. when we are out on the street doing con- – and when I say street, I, I like to use the word contact evangelism better than I do the street. Okay. Um, because sometimes we were out physically on the streets you know, sharing the gospel with people. Other times we would just in our daily lives as we're going. Yeah. Uh, but there were three different incidences where I ran across uh, three different men, and they had said things to me that were very, very negative. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we can discuss the detail of that if you'd like at some point uh, later on in here. But um, basically with those, those, I felt like the devil had already been hammering at me. Right. And he had already got me to a point. And then it was just like those are the kind of the one, two, three axe chops. And when those hit me, I had just come up with, I, I, there was just such an anxiety and a panic that came over me to the point that I was physically ill. I was nauseous. Mm-hmm. I couldn't sleep. I was walking, I mean, you can ask my wife, I was walking the streets at night trying to walk myself to death just to go to sleep at night. Yeah. I was terrified. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden now, where I had my security in Christ and enjoying my relationship with God, I just felt like it was, it was just like everything went black, everything went dark. And I was going, I was like, what, what's going on? I had never experienced such a thing in my life. And it, it, panicked me well let's let's talk about those three things i mean okay. let's let's let let's put those out there so people can hear what those were and how they how they came to you those three those three men yeah well the, yeah the three things that they said or hit you with yeah it was within about a month's time and it was in the fall of 2011 one of them was a, a catholic priest that i had talked with in, in walmart and we had talked in depth about justification and we had talked about the gospel mm-hmm and he, as we, and it was a very good conversation and very, very polite and everything. But really at the end of it all, the, the real nutshell of the whole conversation was the priest wrapped it up with, well, can a person really know? Can they really, really know that they're going to go to heaven when they die? Can they really know that they're a child of God? And just like, just like Imagine Satan, that, a Catholic priest saying that. Yeah, exactly. Just like 
you know, frankly, just like Satan said to Eve, Absolutely. You know, did 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 God really, really say? say yeah. You know, I mean, wow. that's just about how it was. It did, did God really say just that? that little you seed know? of doubt? Mm-hmm. Yes, it was. Yeah. And it, and and Satan had already been jabbing yeah. at me. It wasn't right. like that was the ja- That wasn't the the beginning. That was really the like I said. That was kind of like the axe chop after he'd already been poking at me. Mm-hmm. Uh, this two the two other people. One we were uh, another. We were at a Hispanic fair handing out tracks and. My wife and I were kind of side by side, and, and a man came up to us, and he directed the comment more towards my wife. But already, I was experiencing doubts. I was, this is this really hit me. And uh, that man came up, and he said to my wife, he said, he goes, you know, for every one of those you're handing out, you're driving God further away, meaning the tracks that we were handing out. Yeah. And uh, I internalized that more towards myself. Yeah. And the. And I can't remember the exact sequence of all of those. My wife has a better memory on this than I do, but uh, I always get the sequence out of whack. But the third one was a gentleman on the street. He was uh, he had a billboard on as we were out on a street corner. We were handing out tracks, and the billboard had said, "Jesus is the right fit for me." And I asked the man, I said, "What what is that billboard about?" He said, "Well, he goes, I've been praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for seven years, and he goes, I finally got it." I said, "Okay." I handed him a tract, and I asked him if he was born again. Well, he said, uh, he, he didn't answer my question, and he just yeah. looked at me, and I, and I asked him again. I said, are, are you born again? Very politely. I, didn't, I wasn't being mean to him or anything, and I may have asked him three, four times. And so finally at that point, he, I could tell he was just getting angry. Mm-hmm. And he finally just threw the tract down very angrily, and he said, God just told me, he goes, there's no hope for you. And then he just bolted. Wow, and those last two, the the gentleman at the uh, the Hispanic fair, yeah. and, and that sec that other that other guy I just got done telling you about with the billboard. I almost look at those guys as, as guerrilla warfare. I mean, it was just kind of like hit and run. Right. I mean, they as soon as they hit the comment, they 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 were they, they weren't sticking around. They were for on, a response. they were on yeah. the run literally as they were saying it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I mean, you know, go those, all those, all those three of those together, right then. I mean, it yeah. was really right after those three. It was just like the bottom dropped out. Well, and and you know, as I'm sitting here listening, and I'm sure as the listeners are hearing you, you know, retell that story, those stories. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking it's just like the devil. It's just like the devil to do that. You know, yeah. just just you know, right when you you he knows that you're you know, you have these thoughts and things like that, and he you know, and 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 two of them that he used were you know, quote unquote. You know, I, some people would say they were Christians. You know, mm-hmm. right? Because yes. so, so here you have a priest and a guy that's got a Jesus sign, saying, "You're, you, you know, is are you really saved?" And you know, you know, God just told me that you're false or whatever He said it to you. You know, yes. and and so I'm thinking to myself, you know, so you have all, all this stuff. So it's just, just I, and I love. I want to. I want to really focus on that because I think that's really where we need to look at right now. Because this is the Holy Spirit saying that. Do you see? You know, that's what I'm seeing right now. Do you see, Brent, how He works? And and people, open your mm-hmm. eyes because this is how He works. Mm-hmm. And this is a man who he knew what buttons to push. He knew exactly what buttons to push. You know, right or wrong, this, I do this sometimes. If if things are critical and I'm doing my prayer time, I will I will do two things. I will do a couple things. I I will I will ask the Lord to please sanctify our prayer time so that because you know He is the Prince of the Air, the enemy is, and I know if I'm verbalizing my prayer, that's going into the air. It's going into the air, and so as I'm talking, He's listening. You know, and so if I'm struggling with something and I'm lifting that up to the Lord, the more I verbalize that, he's right. And it's almost like I see and he's over there with his notebook. He struggles with this. He struggles with that. Oh, he's doubting this. And it, it, it inevitably, within a short period of time, I'm coming under attack in those areas. Absolutely. Almost, almost all the time. So I had to start saying, Lord, could you sanctify this time? with me and you and don't let the enemy use this against me or I will pray silently I will not verbalize the critical things I will literally mentally pray to God because I know he's I know he's hearing me that way too and I also pray in the spirit that's a whole nother show (laughs) but I will also pray in the spirit Uh, uh, um, it's just because I know how the enemy works 
And so I'm very cautious anymore because it's happened to me too many times, too many times. And I would venture to say you were probably lifting up some of these concerns you had to the Lord, and I could just see him off to the side taking notes. And here, okay, let, me, let me use my agents, you know, whether they meant to or not. I'm not saying they were possessed. I'm just saying he used them just in the right way, in the right time frame to lay out these series of events that led you to the point of, you know, down that path of where you thought you needed some help. What, uh, Angie, so what were you thinking? Like, okay, all these things that happen, and you see John start to, I mean, did you see that he was starting to change? Was he starting to, you know, say things to you? I mean, what was what was going on at home? It was really tough. Yeah. He, like he said, he was up all hours of the night, wandering through the streets, mm-hmm. um, pacing in the house. And I just kept pointing him back to God, reminding him of who he was in Christ, mm-hmm. you know, letting him know that things that the guys said were like Satan did to Eve. They were twisting what they were saying. And right. it just didn't make sense. The guy at the Hispanic fair that said, for everyone you are passing out of these, you're pushing yourself farther away from God. And it's like, no, we're, we're doing what God wants. Not right. that, that you know we're trying to earn anything, but because we are... Being obedient, and because we love God, we want other people to know how they can be made right with God. So it was just tough, and we really didn't know where to go or what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I wanted you to be here today, because I think you know there's going to be married people that listen to these shows out there, and, and they're struggling with things. And I, I I want to you know to to see the the wife's perspective on things and. Um, kind of like where it would be easy for me and John to sit here and have this conversation, but they need to hear there's also the other half of this equation, and she journeyed with you on this journey as well. I mean, she was right there beside you, and, you know, that's a great testimony as well, you know, the covenant of marriage and, you know, um, you know a good Christian spouse, you know, to, to lean on and support. I can tell you, in some of my darkest times, um, uh, when I've been really down under some heavy attack, you, you, you know, it, it's been a blessing to have a helpmate, you know. And and I feel, I really feel, my heart really goes out to um, single Christians um, that don't have that at home to that twenty four seven somebody they could turn to just about any time and say, I'm struggling, you know, I need help. Um, you know, they have to pick up a phone or go through that extra step, you know, and maybe get three or four people to don't pick up. Um, to to talk to so okay so um, so you've gone through that now you're really you're out walking the streets you 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 know that you're in some trouble I mean things are happening your anxiety is taking over um, so let's let's pick up from there well the thoughts that were coming into my mind I, it, it, the doubts were just getting exasper- exasperated I mean they were getting worse and worse I mean that was really what was was causing me so much panic anxiety was as I was really starting to question myself. Am I really saved? Yeah. I mean, I'm just being very blunt and very yeah. honest. I, no. I, I hate even saying that, but that was really where I was at. I was really questioning, you know, am I really saved? I was trying to make sense, and, I, and my wife can testify to this. I, over and over and over, I would replay my conversion in the last 20 years of my life, and I kept on thinking, how in the world this does not make sense? The last 20 years of my life do not make sense in line with what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. And it just literally turned my mind inside out. I could not grasp how somebody who was born again, because I mean, when, when, I, when I accepted Christ, God radically transformed yes. my life. I yeah. mean, and he did it that day. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can go through the de- I, could, I won't go through the detail of it, but I mean, I'll just it suffice it to say he changed my life radically that yeah. day. And from then forward, um, not without many, many failures along the sure, way, up and sure. downs in our valleys uh, that I'm sure that we can all testify to. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it got to the point that I just could not physically handle it. The, the anxiety level, my the feeling like I was about to have a heart attack. The anxiety, mm-hmm. if, if somebody has, has had an anxiety attack, yeah. I mean, sure, they can understand and, and they can relate to what I'm saying with that. But that was just constant. And constant, and so I went to my doctor, and I had asked. I said, "Is there something that you can give me?" And I would, and I, I, I agree with you. I don't want anybody to come and think that that I'm trying to be harsh with them, because obviously I'm somebody who was on psychotropic mm. drugs. Absolutely. So um, I don't want anybody to feel condemned if they're on those right now. But I was one of those people that that would have said, you know, I, I would never yeah. ever yeah. resort to psychotropic drugs. Sure. 
but I got to that point and uh, it, it just really graduated up from there within a month's time or so it just got worse and worse as far as my anxiety and the amount of drugs that they were putting me on was getting worse and to the point that I, I finally frankly I, I checked myself into Valley Vista mm-hmm. uh, which is a local um, mental hospital mm-hmm. here Yes, and they really just put me on uh, some stronger medications some yeah. sleep meds and everything else and was basically regulated by my psychiatrist thereafter to a lot of as you say you have a, a two page list there of medications that I was on yeah, we'll get into that <laughs> year, over a year and a half so yeah we'll get into that um, just going back to um, what you said and that is that um, you know it, it would be easy to say to sit back and and say well you should just you should have just turned to the Lord you should have just turned to the Lord like like you didn't do that right like, like hey, I didn't do that like I didn't take this to the Lord of course you took it to the Lord you just obviously you just it was so relentless and so overwhelming mm-hmm. that you you know you did what I think most people would do they went to their doctor because you trust your doctor and you're saying you know what I you know and and honestly we are bombarded with marketing towards these drugs. I mean, you know, are you feeling uh, um, uh, anxious? Are you depressed? You know, th- I mean, you think about all the drugs on TV. You open, you can open up a People magazine and, and you see them in their two-page ads and everything like that. And and um, so the marketing is just unbelievable. And it, it just drives people into those doctor's offices. And I think if people really understood the I'm going to call it the demonic side of psychotropic marketing and the way that those uh, those drugs are pushed and 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 basically just ram through the approval process um, with the FDA. It is unbelievable. In fact, there there's a great documentary. I'll take the moment to plug it right now, and we're going to play some audio clips uh, here in a little bit. But um, they're from that documentary. It's called The Marketing of Madness, and it's all about the marketing machine of the big pharmaceuticals, big pharma, and these drugs. And how they have manipulated the system and make billions and billions and billions of dollars every year. I mean, psychotropic medications account for the majority of their profits. You know, you think of all the cancer drugs and all the heart drugs and all the other drugs. You take those combined and they don't even come close to the psychotropic money that's being generated. And so um, so most people do what you did. They, they think, you, you know, I feel ill. So I'm going to go talk to my doctor about it. You know, it's a mental illness. So I'm going to go talk to my doctor. Now, did you go to your, John, did you go to your family doctor? I, I started out with my family doctor and then he was, and he was a Christian and, uh-huh. he, and he kept on telling me, he kept on trying to admonish me. You need to, you need to just trust the Lord. You need to just, uh, which I, I respect him for that. I, I'm glad he yes, did because not absolutely. many doctors that would. Yes. And, and he was just saying, you need to, re- re- you need to realize that God loves you. He, whatever you're going through right now, he loves you and he cares about you, but you know, and, you, and you're exactly right. You know, am I pressing into the Lord? Absolutely. I mean, I was always, if, if you would ask me, am I having my quiet time? Am I, am I in my Bible? Am I praying? Am I reading? Yes, I spent a, a lot of time in the Scripture, and I spent a lot of time in prayer. But it was just like the heavens were brass. Yeah. And, and now we're, the intimacy with, with God was just gone. Yeah, and I know people are going to sit there and say, "Well, you need to confess your sin. You need to sit there and start probing around." Well, you know what? I, I sit there and I, I, I probe myself to the point that I was blue in the face, and to the point that I had cried my guts out, and then cried out my guts even more. Right, and done that day after day after day to the point that I just felt like my heart was about to explode. Well, in full disclosure, too, you know, you and I are friends, and um, you know, there were a group of us that were on your your what we would call like your text line. And, um, you know, that were there for you, um, just whenever you would be down, you would send out your text, you know, and, and so I can attest to the fact that you reached out to your brothers and sisters in Christ and asked for us to help carry your burdens. And we did to the best of our ability. I think that is such a critical thing. I mean, if you look back on your experience, John, I I think you would have to say that that had to have played a, a major role in your you know, coming through all of it, right? Huge. Yeah. Absolutely huge. I, mean, I, I would seriously, I know God is the one who ultimately carried me, has car- it has carried me and is carrying me through this. So I'm not going to tell you that, that, as I told you before, that I am not through this. Right. I, I am not through this valley. Right. Um, it's been almost two years. I'm definitely not where I was two years ago. I'm right. not where I was a year or six months ago. Right. Um, but no, I mean, the body of Christ, you as my brother in Christ and, 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 Al and, and many others I just were, were praying for me and I was being trying to be very transparent about where I was struggling 
and and letting you guys know it's like i need prayer i'm needing just just strength to get through this day i feel like the devil's just trying to just about outright kill me today and my wife has just been Rock. I can, uh, she has been I, <laughs> unbelievable. Seriously, oh, I w- without without her, without you guys, and God using you guys, I really, I really believe I would be dead today. Yeah, I, I know that probably seems pretty strong to some people, but I, the, the emotional, spiritual battle, this would have killed me. Yeah. Well, and I just I, you know, going back to what I said. Yeah, I've you know, you you share you share with each other. Like, there's different times when. That's what's so great about the body of Christ, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that people could point to and say what's wrong with it. But I can tell you one of the greatest things about it is the ability to share each other's burdens, to pick that person up and carry a little bit of their load. I mean, like, you know, we couldn't carry everything for John. And and people can't carry everything for me. But just to know that they're out there to carry a fraction of it, you know, where it, that means something and you don't always see it when you're going through it. And I, I remember, I remember you and some of your, I mean, it's funny. I'm just say this you're sitting here now, you know, as opposed to what, eight, nine months ago. I mean, you got into some, there was some really, really dark times with you. And it's amazing to see what God's done, you know, to see. And I praise God for the fact that you've been delivered out of that, you know, and, um, but I know one of the things that, um, uh, that we had talked about when you were in the throes of it is that once you got on the medication, um, you know, you um, you were so distraught that while you're on it, you thought, I dare not go off of it because if I'm this distraught while I'm on it, I'm afraid to come off of it. I think we even had that discussion at one point. I don't know if you remember or not, but you know that there, you were actually scared to come off of the medication, and uh, just because you felt like you know things were still really bad and you know i better not come off the medication because my goodness i feel this bad while i'm on and i if i come off i'm going to feel worse and i know that there were a couple times when you tried to get off that medication and that was really really kind of rough too there were multiple times i tried to get off the medication and that that created that, that exasperated the situation because yeah. in my mind i kept on feeling guilty for being on the medication. I mean, still, it wasn't like I immersed myself in the medication thinking, okay, this is the solution. Because I knew that the medications were not the solution. From the get-go, I knew that. Mm. But the thing is, though, is, is that it only served to make things worse for me in my mind because I kept on thinking, this, you know, I keep on telling God is enough, yeah. but yet, but here I am on these medications. And that just, that threw me into further spiral even further downward thinking yeah. if i'm a child of god how can i be here how can i be at this point and i kept on saying that to my wife over and over i said how can i be in this place and uh i wanted to get off i kept on trying to get off i would get off and i would spiral downward again in depression and anxiety um you know you yeah. can get to that later but there's i think there's some things that i feel like god brought along my path that helped me to start making uh, a, a climb out of the pit. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about, um, you know, kind of how you, you know, we've talked a lot about the downward spiral, right. and even with the medication, that downward mm-hmm. spiral continued on. And, and, and to your own admission and, and to your credit, you say that, you know, I'm still in the midst of that. And I think that's an important thing, too, because we talked about this when we talked about doing the show. And that was that. You know, you were very honest. You're like, Brent, I just, I don't want to be a hypocrite here because I'm still struggling. It's not like I've been delivered. And, and I, I told you, I said, John, that's what people need to hear. That is the message. I mean, because how much more so relatable are you now? The fact that, hey, I am still struggling with these things. However, I've just, I knew that those drugs weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. I knew there was something about them. And, you know, uh, the fact that you had such a hard time going off and what they don't tell, tell people about them is that they're highly addictive. Now, they don't use the word addictive. If you ask a psychiatrist, are, are, are um, you know, uh, psychotropic medications addictive? They'll say, no, absolutely not. They're not addictive. Um, they're dependent. You become dependent. <laughs> They have dependency issues, mm-hmm. which is just a big play on words. It's just all such a joke. And, um, and so, you know, I, you know, I think to your credit, um, you know, that you, you, we're not sitting here. That, and that's not to say that the Lord couldn't completely deliver you from something. But the bigger message is, is that you're still, you're still going down that valley. You know, you're coming out of it. Obviously, you're coming out of it. But you're still down there, and, and, um, but you're doing it differently. And, and God is using different people, different things in your life. Um, I know there was a pastor that you, you said that had um, been on some medication and you used one of his techniques and we're going to take a break here in just a few minutes, but, and we'll pick back up kind of, let's pick up on that upswing, kind of like coming out of it, you know, type of thing. And, um, 
you know when we when we come back but uh um so you know before we go to break though you know so you 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 go in and you start off on what one medication they just put you on one in the doctor's office yes in my in my uh primary care physician they had put me on one what med- do you remember what your first medication was I'd have to look at the list to, to, to let you know. I could take a look back at the list on the, when we pick up on the break, and okay. I can kind of give you the, the sequence of events. Yeah, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about. Um, let's pick up there. Okay. Let's let's talk about that. Let's uh, let's talk about. Um, I'm sitting here in front of. You. I got two pages in front of me of, of because what John did was he took the labels off of all of his all the different medications they had him on in the last two two years roughly. Approximately yes. Uh, to, in the last two years, and it was enough to fill up two eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper. Once he put them all on there, and um, I haven't sit and tallied them up, but I've got to imagine it's at least twenty twenty something in there um, that they had you on in those two years, which is just astounding to me. So on the other side of the break, we'll pick back up with that. You're listening to Way of Truth Radio, and we'll be right back. Hello, this is Brent Chance with Way of Truth Radio. If you're a regular listener to the Way of Truth Radio program, then would you consider partnering with us? Way of Truth Radio is a listener-supported broadcast. We pride ourselves on keeping our financial overhead extremely low, but there are still costs involved in broadcasting. If you feel that you have been blessed by our radio show or YouTube videos and would like to donate towards bringing these critical topics to the world, you can contact us at wayoftruthradio at gmail.com. Thank you. Okay, everybody, this is Brent Chance, and uh, we're back with Wave Truth Radio, picking back up on our series, Psychotropic Drugs in the Body of Christ, joined in the studio today with John and Angie Jacobs. And uh, before the break, we were talking about some of the different drugs that John had uh, had been on in the past, and uh, just during the break, we had started a, a conversation, and, and uh, I want to go back and pick up on that so that uh, we can kind of point it out. And, and one of the things that um, Angie had pointed out was that it's important to know that it's not like they turn to the drugs first, and that was their first option, first response, okay? And I, I, I can attest this, too. They, they took it to the Lord, and I know they took it to the Lord. It was just that I think things were so, and they were compounding, ever compounding. And, um, and so and even when you went to the doctor, I know you continued with your faith, taking it to the Lord, praying to the Lord, crying out to the Lord, pleading with the Lord. Uh, and all those things, and um, but what you you were just saying something interesting, John, uh, during the break, and I, I wanted to, I want to pick up on that. You were just telling me about how you, you know the, kind of the enemy used, used this thing about you know well n- nobody else you know that's a Christian would so pick up on that, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I you know I think the biggest thing like we were talking about is, is that I felt like as I started going further into this and, and experiencing the doubts that I was and, and the panic and the anxiety that it was it was I was getting hit with, it was getting worse. And that being that I had been saved for almost, over 20 years, that being hit with that many doubts was something that the enemy kept on trying to hit me with. Well, somebody who's this far along in their walk has never really gone through something like this. You know, I've seen other people who maybe two, three years or just a few years into the Lord who had gone through this, but not somebody who's been so long in the Lord. Right. And that was something where I felt like he kept on, I mean, I, the best way I can put it is almost like, it's almost like a boxer getting no, a, a, another box into a corner and just beating the snot out of him. And I just felt like that's where I was at. I felt like I was in the corner and I felt like he was just beating the snot out of me. Yeah. And uh, the other thing too, is that, you know, there was a lot of physical things going on with you and Angie was talking about that. And that was that, um, you know, and, and so that's why you went to the doctor too, is because you were having chest pains and, you yes. know, you were worried about heart attacks and, and, and they ran a whole series of, you know, and, and to your doctor's credit, because I can tell you that that's, that's the um, kind of the, the rarity because, you know, when you start going in to talk to a doctor, you know, and you're saying, well, I'm feeling anxiety or depression. The first thing they want to do, most of them, want to put you on a, on a medication, you know, some kind of antidepressant and we'll just, we'll just start you off on something mild, five milligrams, whatever. And, you know, that's like the first response, you know, let's see how you do. Um, to his credit though, he, he took the opposite approach, which was let's run a series of tests. Let's do some blood work, you know, those types of things, full workup. And, uh, you know, it was only after they eliminated all of the, the physical possibilities that he basically said okay well let's we'll address this with you know with medication yeah the funny thing is john sitting here and i brought it with me because john had given me uh a few weeks ago um at a bible study he brought um two eight and a half by eleven pages where you took your your prescription labels and you you stuck them and taped them to these paper to these pages here and you know if i had to guess one two three 
there's probably 22, 22. Probably, something close to that. Yeah, 22, 23 different medications that they had you on during uh, during that couple of years there. And you'll notice what's at the bottom of the second page that I put uh, after all the medications, though. Yes, at the, at the very bottom of the second page, uh, he put, but God, with three exclamation points. And that is, I mean, that is the, that is the victory because, you know, um, you know, as you, as you were journeying through all this and, and going through the things you were going through, um, you know, Angie was just saying that um, you know God had led you led you to some some other Christian brothers that you had read their books and just, just different things. Talk about some of that. Some about the, like the little God things where God would kind of lead you to somebody or and 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 just kind of you know. Let's talk about coming up out of all of that. Well, I would say um, the whole thing was a journey. Uh-huh. And it still continues to be. Yeah. Uh, November, you know, and I mentioned in November of twelve, I went to a, a counseling place down in Southern Indiana called Twelve Stones Counseling, uh, and was referred by a Christian brother when I had first gotten saved. I, I knew this brother almost twenty years ago, and, and reconnected with him just recently, only for him to actually leave to move to another state within a few months after reconnecting with him at a church that we started going to. So, uh-huh. um, I was just thinking of God's providence. In connecting us and him referring me down there because that really helped. Uh, it, and uh, I have to really commend that. I have to give God the praise that because my counselor, who I had down at Twelve Stones, really was on the same journey that I was, but further down the road. Yeah, and uh, and I like the way he he termed the whole counseling session, so I don't want to focus on that, but he, he made a comment. He said, you know, he, after, after evaluating everything, he said, you know what? He said, you feel like God's redheaded stepchild. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, that's about it. And, uh, but from there, he walked me through on just really standing firm in my identity in Christ and realizing that God will never leave me nor forsake me, no matter how I feel in the midst of all this. From November of 12 to early 13 uh, in March, we started hearing some people on the radio, a couple pastors, Tommy Nelson, um, Milton Vincent, and they had trekked similar journeys where they were were getting into anxiety, depression, uh, panic, Mm -hmm. and they were struggling with their identity in Christ as well and attacks of doubts on their salvation. And uh, I'm, I won't belabor what all those, those, at least two of those pastors had said, but one of them, Milton Vincent, had said that uh, he felt like the Lord had told him, Milton, preach the gospel to yourself. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, Lord, I am preaching the gospel. I'm preaching the gospel from the pulpit every, every Sunday. You know, he's a pastor. So, uh, no, Milton, you need to preach the gospel to yourself on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And so from there, he started preaching Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11 to himself. And I kept on thinking, and my pastor was telling me the same thing. You know, you need to preach the gospel to yourself. He said, too many Christians, they, they think the gospel is something that I do at a certain point in time, that I get saved, and that's the one the gospel is for me. Now the gospel is for the unbeliever. Right. But yet the gospel is for everybody. The gospel is for us even on a daily basis, for, for victory over sin, and, 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 and knowing that, that, that our security is in Christ in the gospel. So that was really, seriously, that sounds crazy, but that was kind of eye-opening to me. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, that, you know, in journeying, journeying with you down this road, I think all of us, if we had Alan in here and some of the other guys in here, we, we would probably all agree that, that once you started doing that and reciting that gospel to yourself, I mean, that's where, you know, and Angie, you speak up and tell me but that that to me seemed to be like it, it was um an aha moment like things started to change at that point i mean and they were i'm sure they were changing up to that point but that seemed to be really a turning point for you and and uh, i know um because i think we were at a, a small group meeting and you had said you had just started doing that mm-hmm. and it just seemed like it was just a you know just a turning point i mean i don't know i, mean, I think you started seeing glimmers of light at that point yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, it was it was March of twelve, and then from March to I would say about June or July, so about three or four months. Uh, whereas I was just almost feeling hopeless, like I was never going to be off these medications. I mean, I just really it was almost just I thought this isn't going to change. But as I as I continued to just preach the gospel to myself, because that was one thing Milton said. He said, just keep 
preaching the gospel to yourself daily. I was doing it day and night. And as I started to continue to do that, I kept on realizing, you know, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the power is in the gospel. Yeah. It's, it's unseen, but yet it, right. it, it works its effect. And as I, as I continue to just seize on what I, what I believed and what I knew to be true and held on to that, seriously, miraculously, there's no other explanation but that ultimately, I mean, because I, I really held out almost almost no hope that I was ever going to be able to sleep on my own again. And get off of them. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, but yet, but yet uh, by mid-August, I, w- I was completely off of everything after Angie and I had prayed through a, a weaning schedule. We, I did multiple times trying to do a cold turkey, which yes, almost about I, killed me. Let me, um, just, let me just say this right yes. there before you go any further. Uh, for the listeners out there that might be taking these drugs and you're wanting to get off of them, I, <clears throat> I caution you. Please do not try to quit cold turkey. Um, these drugs have a powerful psychological effect. They have changed brain chemistry, changed body chemistry. You cannot, these are highly dependent, according to their terms, I'll call them addictive drugs. And you cannot, it's like it's like heroin or something like that. To try to quit cold turkey is just brutal, brutal. And, um, you know, uh, you need to talk to your doctor. I think you need. I really, I really do. I think if a doctor can help you get on them, they should be able to help you get off of them. Uh, at the very least, talk to a pharmacist. I, I've heard where they've had to actually, like, go into a, a compounding pharmacist and have them basically compose specific amounts to take them down so small at a time to get the people off of these. That's what some people have to do. Mm-hmm. But that's the way you have to do it because to do it the other way is just so brutal. I have seen it wreck so many people. Um, personally and um to the point where they had to be institutionalized for a short period of time until they got their biochemistry back up and had to you know they had to put them back on them and and so um there is a way to do it um so i that's i just wanted to interject that sorry about that i just no i've seen too many people <laughs> trying to get off of them and it's just brutal i, I agree 100 percent. and we yeah. did talk to the doctor on telling him that we he didn't want to continue on the drugs and he kind of gave us some early on a little bit of how you would come off of it yeah. at some point. It sounds like you have a great doctor. <laughs> My psychiatrist was a little bit more, he was wanting to keep me on them longer than I wanted. But, uh, I mean, I pushed the schedule further than what it did. But we did do it very, very incremental. I mean, as, as, I, kept on, as I kept on stumbling and I would, uh, I would crash again, I would think, okay, I'm doing it too fast. So we'd pray. So I, as much as I wanted to be off them quickly, it was over months, really, that ultimately I just did things very incremental and one drug at a time. And primarily the main thing was is I just was like, Lord, I've got to be able to sleep. I will die without sleep. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, ultimately I, I am, I'm i not sleeping like I want to be right now. But you know what? I'm getting I'm getting a full night's sleep. Still well, not, yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, um, a certain amount of that, you know, because I, I – will wake up and my mind will start racing, you know, and I, I just, I know once I, that happens, it's very difficult to go back to sleep. And so, um, cause you know, being self-employed, you got work obligations and everything else going on. And so you're, you're thinking about your schedule and I'm so far behind. And, you know, so once my mind starts, it's very hard to shut it back off. And so, um, I can relate to that. And I think most people can relate to that component of it, but you know, to the extreme that you were going, you know, down that spiral, that was one of the other things we talked about. And Angie, you were telling uh, me during the break, talk about like, you know, we talked about the drugs and, mm-hmm. and like why he had to be on some of them just to, just to try to like the sleeping aspect of it. He needed to, it, it wasn't enough just to be on a, a sleeping pill. I mean, because you were so anxious that a sleeping pill uh, by itself just didn't cut it. I mean, right. Right. Yeah. Right. So I mean that's you know and so that's I, how I was, you end up. Go ahead. I was I was I was on and all these work together. I mean when I was talking to my psychiatrist, I was on an antidepressant along with anti-anxiety medication that I was taking intermittently throughout the day. I was taking uh, naturals like valerian root and melatonin. I mean they say you're almost taking like five milligrams of melatonin. I was taking like twenty milligrams, almost eighteen to twenty milligrams of melatonin along with my Ambien and you know. I mean, all this stuff together, the sleeping medication, the natural herbals, the anti-anxiety, the antidepressants, and still really, frankly, that would only maybe get me about six hours of sleep, maybe or so, and even then it was spotty. When you're on the medications, you know, a lot of, a lot of the side effects 
of these medications are pretty extreme. Um, suicidality. I mean, did you ever have, do you ever struggle with that? Like, you know, that desire or like just to I, end it or I would say that, uh, you know, they, because that's the first thing when you go into a mental hospital is, are you having thoughts of suicide? Okay. Yeah. Because that's what allows them to keep you when you say Ex- Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and, and was I really in my mind thinking I'm going to commit suicide? No. Okay. I, I really can never say that I, it was ever at a point because, I mean, there was a point before I got saved, you know, over 20 years ago that I was at a point that I was suicidal. So, right. no, I would say that no, I was not at that point. Did those thoughts enter my mind? Just end it. You know, this is just too much. You can't handle it. Yes, I will say that the devil kept on throwing those darts at me with that. But I, I wouldn't say that they were things that I'm, I was even seriously, would have even even remotely seriously considered. Yeah, well, praise God for that. I mean, because there are so many people. I mean, it's well documented that these drugs, have, that is one of the major side effects of, of psychotropic drugs is increased suicidality, increased uh, um uh, homicidal ide- ideation. Um, you know, you see these people that are mass shooters and things like that. And almost inevitably, almost every single time you will read in the documentation that they were on at least one, two, three, four, sometimes psychotropic medication, very, very powerful, you know, very powerful medications. And, uh, so they, um, you know, that's, that's well documented. I mean, there's just no, no question about that. And, um, and so it's just, it's refreshing that that didn't necessarily happen to you you know, in terms of having those strong, but the thoughts were there. Yeah. I mean, the, the thoughts did come. So, and that I had a hard time differentiating sometimes. It's like, okay, a lot of times I was struggling through this, you know, is this my thoughts? Is this the medication? Is it, is it something that's coming from the devil? I mean, it created a lot of, I mean, even right now it, it, it created a lot of confusion. Yeah. I mean, whereas I had a lot of spiritual and mental clarity before all this, that was one thing I struggled with is like now things that were so clear to me, we're becoming so clouded. That was so alarming to me. I, I want to pick up on that. I want to pick up on that because I think that's the that's a really critical part of this. You know, in the Bible, when when the Bible in the New Testament, specifically in the Greek, when it talks about you know um, sorcery and witchcraft and things like that, the word that is used in the Greek is pharmakeia, mm-hmm. right? Pharmakeia, yeah. which is the root word of where we get pharmacy, pharm- pharmacology, um, and so basically what they were saying in the New Testament when they would use that word was that you know when they practice magic a big part of what they did was was potions and you know uh, compounds and things like that and herbs and they would combine things and it was all meant to you know when you're doing with sorcery and things like that it was all meant to basically alter the conscious mind to where they would open themselves up for these demonic experiences these you know magical mystical experiences things like that and so i you know coming at this from a from a supernatural aspect in, in a christian aspect i look at that like you know um you like i've listened to some of the 911 calls from some of the people that have been you know like mass shootings and then they've like killed family members then killed others and they'll call 911 and there was one i can remember specifically where the young man he was a teenager and he was on some pretty heavy psychotropic medications and he made the comment somebody needs to stop these voices in my head and He's literally hearing voices telling, and I can't tell you, you know, all the other, you know, some great documentaries out there, um, but just um, where they will talk about hearing these voices and telling them to just end it or telling them that they're no good, um, telling them that, you know, what kind of person are you to be on these drugs and you're terrible. And so when you start talking about while you're on them, this cloudiness, you know, whereas before, yeah, things were going on, but you had clarity, you could see, you could see better, but there was this, this cloud that can kind of come over you. That to me is probably from the spiritual aspect of all of it. That's the most concerning to me. That's the one thing I think the Lord has pointed out to me more than anything. And that is that there is a supernatural element of these, because what the, a lot of them do is, is they're, they're called mild tranquilizers. And so they are meant to dumb down your consciousness. And, and I, want, I want to comment on that, Brent, because that's something really, really key. What I was going through was a lot of mental spiritual assault in the spiritual warfare. I felt like the devil was really trying to attack me on the issue of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And he was really trying to bottom, bottom line to this whole th- thing. I mean, I would say if the, the most underlying thing at, it was it was it was a job it was just like almost like job just like job's wife yeah you know what why don't you just curse god and die if i have to say anything that's probably been the most relentless attack on me right now through this whole thing where's god in all this yeah you know and with that 
I will say that the medications, they numbed me down. And they numbed me down to the point that I didn't have to really deal with that that attack on my mind. Mm -hmm. I will say that in preaching the gospel to myself, starting in early March of this year, of 2013, from there, I've had to really... I feel like the Lord has been saying to me, I'm going, there's a, a psalm, and, and I feel like the, the Lord has given me this psalm, and uh, it's a, a verse out of the psalms, and also to my wife, and because she sat there and told me one day, she goes, I really feel like the Lord is giving me this verse for you. Mm-hmm. And it's a verse that I feel like the Lord was giving to me, and it was Psalm 144.1. It says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, and my fingers for battle. And I felt like God was has been has been and, and continues to tell me that, that John, I'm going to train your hands in a new way for war, spiritual warfare like you've never had to deal with before. And frankly, I've told God, it's like, God, I don't want to do this. I am not strong enough for yeah. this. I can't do this. I, am, I feel like I am emotionally collapsing under, underneath the weight of all this, and I feel like I'm stumbling so badly. But you know what? I've also told him that I don't want to stop. I don't, whatever he's got for me, I don't want him to stop this process. I want him to do whatever he needs to do to affect and make whatever he needs finish to do the work, finish yeah. the person and, and do what he needs to do in yep. me to do what I need to do. That's an interesting thing because, <clears throat> you know, Alan and I have had many discussions about this and that we feel like, you know, we're here in the Indianapolis area. Um, you know, Indianapolis is really spiritually speaking, like supernaturally speaking, it's really a dark place because we've got, you know, like the second largest, you know, Masonic temple in the country. We've got, you know, um, the largest, um, uh, you know, North American mosque in America, uh, just outside of town. We've got, um, you know, the Mormons coming in, they're going to want to build a temple here. I mean, you name it, we've got it. I mean, we've got it. Um, uh, it's, and so when we look around and we see people and when you say that story, it's like, it's like we see God. It's almost like He's raising up these end time type soldiers, like that, because there are going to be so many people that are on these drugs or that have turned to these drugs, and there needs to be a voice, you know. And God needs a voice. He's going to use a voice, you know, to say, you know, you don't have to have them. You can do this, you know. You can make it without them, or whatever that message ends up being, you know. Some, you know, somebody else that might be, you know, that they're going through. Um, uh, you know, something with their church and, you know, th- they're seeing things in the church uh, that they don't agree with and the Lord's bringing that on their radar. Just different things, but I just, there's so many people going through so many different things and we've talked to so many different people and they all kind of come to that same conclusion like, I feel like God's preparing me for some major event type of thing and uh, and that's kind of like where Al and I are out with the whole thing, you know, uh, him as a pastor and just me as somebody that's a lady it's just, just, you just, there's just too much going on in the body and you see God, you see God really galvanizing some foot soldiers here that are you know that he's preparing and um you know so that's that's a whole uh that's a whole nother show really could do a whole show on that but just um you know i do think that god is 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 doing that work in you you know and that he's he's preparing you you know to be that voice and 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 others i mean not just you but there's others that he's preparing out there that um that are like you that have gone to that down that road come off of them um, and, you know, just journeyed down that road. But I do think that, you know, there, I, I feel that there is a very demonic part of these drugs. And when you start really doing the research about the drugs and you start doing the, um, how they affect the brain, um, and you talk about like, and you start looking at verses like the full armor of God, how do you put on the full armor of God when your conscious mind has been so subdued by medication that you, your guard is down? I mean, your guard is down and um, you're exposed. Um, but if God is allowing you to go through that, then he's He's doing a work with you because he's going to show people that you can journey down that road and come out of it at the end. Um, you know, I'm, I'm big on that, you know, Christians need to share their struggles with other Christians because, like, if I'm struggling with... Um, Depression. Who better to talk to than a Christian that's journeyed through depression and come out the other side, or divorce, or you know, you name it. Absolutely. You know, I think that's one of the one of the key things that I kept on telling my wife is is that I'm not interested in. Talk, I don't. I don't. I kept on telling her I don't want to talk to that person. Don't want to talk to them. I want. I wanted other brothers and sisters around me, like you guys. You, yeah. You encouraged me and strengthened me, and and, and I'm, I'm very glad for that. But 
really ultimately kind of share with somebody, you know, heart to heart. I there were certain people I just didn't want to talk with because I thought, well, if they had not gone down this road that I've gone down with, not to the degree that I have, I thought, I don't want to talk to them because I thought, you know, I want somebody that can tell me and give me hope that, you know what, I've, I've been down that road. I have been where you're at. I have a, a, a pastor friend of mine that I go to church with. He's, he's journeyed down the same road, and he's uh-huh. about a year further down the road from where I'm at. And, and he, when we sat down the first time and started talking, it only took him a few minutes. He would tell me, he said, you know what, you're thinking this. Yeah. And this is why you're thinking this. And this is where your thought process is going. And, boy, it was just like he was reading my mind. Yeah. And I thought, you know what, nobody, I've had nobody else talk to me like that. And uh, it really encouraged me. As crazy yeah. as that sounds, no, you know, it's, it was, it's not crazy. It, it's it biblical. Was, That's it not was crazy. Just, it was just so encouraging to me, thinking, okay, you know what, Lord, there is hope in this. You know that that you know the devil's over here trying to tell me your situation is hopeless. You're hopeless. You're not going to get through this. Mm-hmm. You're going to die in the midst of this. And it's like, no, I'm going to get through it. God's with me, and He's not forsaken me. And even though I may not feel Him like I used to, uh, you know, there's a verse in Isaiah 50. 10, and I don't have the verse memorized, but my wife sent it to me in a devotional here in the past few weeks. But it talks about, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically it, it talks about uh, uh, let him who walks in darkness listen to the word of my servant, meaning Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, let him who walks in darkness trust in my word and trust in my name. So essentially the devotional was that... Uh, um, you know, as Christians, we can walk through times of darkness. We can walk through about the valley of the shadow of death. And that sometimes God even allows us to go to that place so that we can know that even in the darkness that we can trust him. Yeah. That even if the lights go out, that we can still trust that God is still there. And I've seen, we've seen miracle after miracle where God has just done things to me and, and spoken to me and my wife just over and over. And I'm saying recently, I'm saying just over and over within through the last two years, just keep going, keep waiting, keep trusting me. Don't give up. You know, it'll be worth it. Just keep going. I'm here. And, but, you know, not having the intimacy and the, and the, the presence of God, like I used to, it's, it's, it's hard. Right. But I still feel like God is there, but he's there in a way that I'm just not used to. And, right. and just encouraging me that things will change, but I need to keep going. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too. Um, you had said, I think during the break, I'm not sure what we said it on the show, but um, you had said that, you know, you really came down to you have two choices, right? So share those with everybody in case we... Two choices are is quit or keep going with the Lord. And the first one is not an option for me. Right. I, you know, and I kept on, and I've had to keep on reevaluating, doing a heart check on myself. Like, what did I come to Christ for? Did I come to him for a, a nice, cushy life? Did I come to him for whatever, health, wealth, whatever or not? I mean, I came to Christ for salvation. I came to him because I wanted to know him. I mean, that started when I was almost seven, eight years old. I mean, I wanted to know who God was at seven or eight. And it wasn't another fi- until another 15 years before I would ever even hear the gospel until I was about 23 years old. You know, yeah. that I could know how to know God. I could, I could hear even how to know God. But it's like I keep on reminding God. It's like, God, I wanted to know you as a little kid. That was the whole reason behind this whole thing is I wanted to know you. And that is the basis behind all this. You know, I wanted a relationship with you. And I want that relationship to, ship to continue no matter how hard it gets. I mean, you didn't give up on me. You know, I don't want to give up on you, so please help me. Just help carry me through this, that I that I'll have the strength to continue on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that's. I think no matter what you're going through, that's ultimately, you know, if you're going through a trial, you know, I mean, that's one of the promises of Christ is that you know, in this life, you will have trouble, you know, but I overcome the world, you know, and so that's what we have to hold on to is that He has overcome the world, and we're the time we're here is such a vapor. I mean, it's it's a vapor, and in, in, in the in the aspect of eternity, mm-hmm. I mean, it truly is a vapor. This is nothing, you know. And so, while we're here, you know, what we go through and those things, it's it's all temporal. It's all temporary, um, you know. And so, yes, it stinks while you're going through it. I mean, it's it's brutal sometimes when you're going through it. And but you know, I can think back of you know a lot of my challenges have been more financial in my life, and you know, you know, being involved in real estate when they had the market collapse and everything in '08. Um, and losing everything, but you know, and I remember just just 
being a wreck. I mean, I think I always joke around with, with uh, Alan. I think, you know, if I was ever going to go on any kind of psychotropic medication, it would have been when, when I was losing my house, you know, filing bankruptcy, you know, losing everything. And, um, but praise God, I didn't. But I, I can tell you there were a lot of sleepless nights. There was times when I think maybe I got an hour a night and then had to go work all day. And it just where your body becomes physically just a wreck and just run so run down that you don't know how you don't know how you're going to make it, you know, and and, you know, you just you just cringe when you wake up like you would be sleeping and you would wake up and you cringe because you knew you knew you weren't going back to sleep. I mean, you just knew you weren't going back to sleep. That was it. You were up for the rest of the day, and it was on, and you would just go until you literally dropped from exhaustion and then maybe get another hour. And um, and I remember, but, you know, the, the, a lot of the stressors on me was were, were uh, you know, financial stuff and, and that type of thing and not knowing, you know, what was going to happen. And I do remember crying out to the Lord, and I do remember... Um, and, and I think everybody's a little different. I'm not saying I'm not even trying to compare myself to what you went through. I'm just saying that I experienced it to some degree. And I always say, you know, it was the worst for me. Like I'm saying, like everybody's pain and suffering, it's it's the absolute worst for them. Like it's mm-hmm. different. It's different for everybody. Like, like you know, I can't, it's, this is not a compare and contrast thing. It's like, oh, I, my suffering is a lot worse than yours because that would be like saying, you know, your suffering is not nearly as bad. <laughs> you don't tell somebody that's going through cancer that their suffering is not as bad as yours. Right? You're, or whatever it is because they're suffering as much as they can suffer. You know, like it, that's in their mind, that's as bad as it gets, you know. And and so that's where I was at with it. Just in my mind, it was as bad as it as bad as it could get, you know. And um, you know, actually, in my case, it led to my challenging God and getting born again, which praise God for that. But um, you know, even after all that, it, it still wasn't a road. You know, this this you know, flower pastures and beautiful things. It, it was rough. It was really rough. But I had God. It's like you said, but the bottom of your page, but God, you know. Yeah. So I mean. That's just that kind of like well that was that was my take on it and you know I could have but I could have easily taken those drugs and I, and, and that's the thing I, I'm not I'm, I'm not here to condemn anybody that's taken them I know you're not either obviously um, but what we want to do is to try to say there is there is a component about these things that are um, I don't think they're godly I think there's a component that's not godly um, and I feel in my spirit totally feel that I, I I'm convinced and I know based on the research I've done. Um, but that's not to convict, you know, con, you know, uh, condemn somebody that's on them. That's a brother or sister in Christ. My thing is, how can we help you? You know, and and that's and that's exactly right. I mean, I've got friends who are still on medication. Me I mean, too. I don't I family don't, members. I don't condemn them. I I I, I feel their pain. Yeah. I I, I I I can feel it. I I know. And it's just like I, so. I just keep on trying to encourage them. And the same thing. I have. We talked about another brother who is who's going through the same thing. Who's been on long term and. Um, he was asking me, so how did you get off? And it's like, you know what? It, it was really through the preaching of the gospel. I mean, the power is in the gospel at the start, and the power is in the gospel all the way through. I mean, as Romans says, from faith to faith. It's, it starts with faith. It ends with faith. It's faith in the middle. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have to just keep trusting God and the, that the power is in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's in Christ himself, and it's in, in the, his work on the cross and in his resurrection and reminding yourself of who you are in Christ. Yeah, yeah. Because adoption is just so. I, I believe that adoption is so key. I, I grew up very feeling grew up feeling very insecure mm-hmm. about my relationship with with my dad. And and not to say I love my dad. We have a very good relationship today. And he just got saved here within the last few weeks. Been praying for him for over twenty years. That's amazing. It's great. Eighty three years old. Eighty three years old. So never give up hope. Never always, give up. I'll always pray for your family members. But uh, but just. Just the security of of our relationship with God. I mean, I, that is really key to me. Is that God? I just want to know that you got your hand on me, even though I can't feel or sense you in this in the same way that I have been able to. And again, I don't know how else to say it other than that God has been speaking to us, to me, to my wife, and just trying to reassure me of that in very miraculous ways. Mm-hmm. It's not just not the way that I want. Hmm. I can't explain that. I, and that, that's probably not going to make some people very theologically comfortable. I understand. It doesn't make me comfortable at all. Right. It, may, it creates a lot of discomfort for me. It, right. it's, it's thrown me into a tizzy as far as my theological framework. Well, I, 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 I love the fact that um, even though that you don't feel that, that uh, intimacy like you once did 
um, with God, still you press on. Yes. And because I think that when this is fully realized, that your intimacy when it returns come to its fullness will be so much deeper, so much more powerful. And so when you're sitting down from somebody and you're looking them in the eyes, they're going to see the Lord. They're going to see God in a way that they've never seen God because you're living proof. And, you know, in, in that intimate, in that intimate intimacy will return, you know, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And he, he is faithful in all those things, but you know, we're coming to the end of the, the time here, but you know what I'd like to do? A couple things, and we'll kind of end up on the, on these two things. Is number one, let's can you read that passage from Romans that you have made kind of your life verse when you were coming out of that? Are you talking about Romans five one through eleven? Yes. I didn't bring my reading glasses, so uh, I'll have to try to see if I can. Or if you want to pass me your Bible, I'll read it. Yeah, because I think that's important. Let's get that out on the airwaves where those maybe some people out there that are struggling with this can uh, can read can read and hear this. And remember Ephesians chapters and the, one, two, and three too for your identity. Yeah, Ephesians chapter one, one two, two, and three. three. Okay, so you guys go there. So what, what do we say? Chapter five, one through eleven. Eleven. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope of the glory of God and not only this but we also exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare, would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For it, for it will, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Yeah, that's a powerful, powerful verse. Amen. Powerful verse. Um, John, in wrapping up, I guess you know what would um, if you could if you could talk to somebody you know that's that's on these drugs and that um, you know doesn't want to be on them, maybe having side effects from them, um, but can't seem to get off of them. Um, you know, and and you know what would what just. Speak to them right now. Just tell, what would you say to them? You know, assuming again, assuming that this person is, has a relationship with Christ, right? I mean, if, if they if they if they know Christ, you know, then I would work from there. If the person doesn't know Christ, you know, then I would say the first thing you need to do is just recognize that you're a sinner yeah. and that Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and to repent and trust, put your faith and trust in Him alone. Uh, if the person's a believer, I would say. You know, how you got saved was through the gospel. God changed you through the power of the gospel. Camp out in some of those verses. Take, mm-hmm. you know, read Romans chapter 5. Read it not just once. Read it two, three, four times a day if mm-hmm. you have to. Morning, noon, night. And Ephesians 1 through 3, reminding yourself of, of our position in Christ. Because, again, the power is in the gospel. Um, and that's how God changes us. It, he changes us through the gospel. Yes, he changes us through other things like suffering and, and, and things like that. Um, the other thing is, is I, don't disengage from church. Don't disengage from fellowship with other brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Find other brothers and sisters who are going to get around you and help build you up, help encourage you, who are going to faithfully pray for you like you guys have for me. Yeah. Um, don't don't uh, don't push it on people who don't want it because I know that there's other brothers and sisters who just could not deal with what I was going through and and I understand that I held right. no, no animosity towards them it, it so it was very over I know it was overwhelming for me I know it's been overwhelming for my wife 
I'm very thankful to have my wife with me. I mean, I, I feel really bad for people who are single. Yeah. I mean, because I, I couldn't imagine going through this, you know, if I was single. Right. Um, I would have never wanted to take my wife through this, and I've, I've told her that over and over. But uh, um, allow other Christians to encourage you. Just, mm-hmm. just receive that. I think it's a big one, and I think you know the other thing is is preaching to my preaching to yourself because uh, there's a verse in I don't know if it's in the book of First Samuel maybe where where David is about to be stoned by his own uh, the men who were with him when he was out in the wilderness there was like six hundred men and 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 all their kids and their their wives had been taken mm-hmm. and they were talking about stoning David and it says but David encouraged himself in the Lord it's good to have other brothers and sisters who can encourage us and it's good. Who the Lord, the Lord, I mean, God is the one who gives encouragement. Yeah. And He gives encouragement to those people and through friends, family, spouses. But we've got to learn to encourage ourselves. And I, I've, I've got just a lot of different tools that I use around me to encourage myself. I keep scripture verses around me just constantly. Mm-hmm. I have different books that people who've gone through these trials and, and tribulations, you know, that, that uh, uh, they've spoken specifically to my situation. I highlight the snot out of those books and, yeah. and tag them. And I keep those around me. And when I'm feeling down or whatever else, I mean, I, I keep those devotionals and everything else around me that, that help build me up and help to encourage me just keep going and keep trusting the Lord. And the Lord is faithful. And he's, he's there. And even though maybe I can't see him working in the midst of this, that he's, go, he's going to take me through this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a silver bullet. No, it's not. I've looked no. for a silver bullet. And you know what? I can, just, I can say this. <laughs> There's not one. No, no. And it, yeah. And, and, and the solution is not a, is not an easy one. But I know I knew when I asked you that question that you were going to point them back to the place where they should be pointed. And that was to the word of God, to yes. God and, and pressing into him and, and holding on to the, that hope that was in that verse, you know, talking about that verse and hope and, and stuff. And so, uh, well, I thank you guys both for coming. I know that, um, we've, uh, we've talked for a while about doing this and some things happened and couldn't, uh, meet the last time, but, um, I just think it's such a critical topic and uh, I look forward to do, uh, doing a few more shows on it and, and just, you know, attacking it from some different perspectives and things like that. And even getting some of those single guys in here that um, don't have the spouse to lean on and, and getting that perspective. Cause I want the single people out there to hear, you know, from that side as well. And um, because I think far too many times I say, well, he, they don't understand cause I'm single or you know, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to get everybody in that, that we could, we could get in there. So, yeah, I want to just give one of the last, and this, uh, this underlies the whole thing of what I said though, but I, I want to say it explicitly. I think it's very critical for, for us to first, you know, you speak, you said, speak to, to them out there that who may be going through the same thing or mm-hmm. something similar, reminding ourselves of God's goodness. Yeah. Re- reminding ourselves that God loves us. Yeah. That, that he is there for us, even when we may not feel like he's there for us, he's still there. Yeah. And that, you know, as it says in first Timothy, I think it's the first Timothy, it says that if, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Yeah. You know, that even if when we're stumbling or when, even when we doubt or when we're struggling, that God still remains faithful, he will still remain faithful to us even when we're unfaithful. And that to me is very critical oh, to yeah. just grab onto that and even though maybe it's it's tough to hold on to that hold on to that with all your might that god is faithful even when we're not yeah i always tell people he's got he's got really broad shoulders so if you know if you find yourself being really down on god and stuff like that he he knows he knows yeah and it's okay i I think it's okay to just to question god and to cry out to god and 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 say what's going on i don't get this i don't understand this and and stuff like that because he is faithful you know when our faith is weak weakest you know he's really made strong and so um yeah that that's a great word well this has been way of truth radio with your host here brent chance and uh again just uh we want to just lift lift you guys all up out there and we just thank god for you and um just pray for uh john and angie and all those out there that uh that are, uh, you know, dealing with this and, um, just continue to lift them all up in your prayers. Thanks so much.